Shall we wait just one more minute and then uh, go ahead and get started? The, the COVID struggle working from home is real. I can I can hear my dryer alarm singing to me that the, that the clothes are done. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about flexible work environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank everyone for joining the session. I, I think this is going to be a really neat session um, in the Connect Summit. And the, with the panel that we have, I, I don't think there, there's a lot that I need to do to add to it other than maybe just do a quick round of introductions. And you know, we have Christy Elton here from University of California, Office of the President. Her background is uh, PT ergonomics, safety, 250,000 employees, 12 campuses, five medical centers, and a law school. Um, so she has a very deep in, uh, understanding of, of those challenges, right? Even before COVID and now going into COVID and, you know, uniquely can help with um, the rules and regulations around um, the Cal OSHA uh, return to work policies as well. And I know that's been a bit of a stress and struggle for UC Christy on your end. And then, you know, Martha Hagmeyer comes from uh, EA Sports where she ran a global uh, wellness program that embraced ergonomics as part of the wellness program and launched it during COVID in a very, very quick but successful way. And, and her participation um, from her employees was, was greater than 80%. And which, you know, ultimately when you look at participation from a global um, software risk management ergonomics program, wellness program, if you're getting 50, 60% participation um, with incentives, you're generally pretty happy with it. So she completely blew that out of the water. She's now running higher calling solutions, which is her consultant and advisory uh, uh, organization. And so going to bring a wealth of knowledge from the wellness aspect. And Sue Denicky comes from one of our, our strongest partners, and that's Mar Marsh Risk Control. And uh, Sue has all of these underlying experience and knowledge, <laughs> including being a developer. And so there's times where we're building new courses and Sue is absolutely patient because she understands the development world. But, you know, also being a nurse and then coming into the Marsh uh, practice world of being an ergonomist and then helping run ergonomic programs globally for organizations from a virtual standpoint um, from her team of ergonomists. So, Without further ado, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the introductions because we have so much to cover. I'd, I'd really kind of like to turn everything over to the panel. Um, Dee, do you have time to kind of open up the poll to get us started? Or uh, Sue, do you want to go ahead and kick things off at this point? Yeah, Dee, why don't you start the poll and, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll start with some general statements. Uh, you know, it was interesting. We have been providing virtual ergonomic services for our clients for over 10 years. So when the pandemic hit a year ago, we were uniquely positioned to help our clients uh, get into the groove of, of helping folks who were now working at home. Uh, and there's a lot of things to consider when, when you send people home to work. And so we're hoping that our audience will provide us with some, some questions that we can uh, discuss and provide some, some advice. Yeah, great, thank you, Sue. Martha, from your perspective and just bringing ergonomics into wellness and making it part of well-being, like what, where did you see your success from? Well, I think it was, I just also want to say I'm really happy to be here. I'm part of this amazing summit, and I hope that all of you that are attending are getting a lot out of it, um, and especially with um, with what we're sharing with you today. So um, I think what really helped the program be a success, honestly, was understanding um, our employee population and being able to assess where they were at. Um, so gathering that information from them and then being able to come up with an overall strategy on how we wanted to create a, um, a continuum of services for our employees. So rather than just a quick band-aid of, you know, of virtual assessments or even self-assessments, really looking at the continuum of training, 
assessments, both self and virtual, and procurement as needed of product, um, and follow up with that as well. Um, and, and discovering a great partner um, in Cardenas, without a doubt, of being able to be flexible with us, um, having a global population of 13,000 employees, um, and with all different kinds of um, needs and personas, and being able to personalize that experience for them, um, really help them have that sense of caring um, from the organization, um, as well as with um, having a great partner to be able to report out on those kinds of metrics that we were able to come up with. Thank you, Martha. And Martha, one last, one last question from Maya. Like, from our perspective, when you hear about participation at such a high level, even in compliant uh, countries, we struggle with getting that type of participation. Um, what is it? What drove the success in your participation? I think it was uh, several fold. I think one was um, leadership. Um, acknowledging that this was um, an important endeavor, hearing that um, the um, that the results of um, employees working from home and struggling with their conditions, starting to develop neck or back or shoulder pain and reporting into that, um, being able to communicate that out as an organization to say, hey, we hear you. And this is for your, for your benefit to help you through this. Um, the content itself was very engaging, very, um, as I like to say, we EAified it. So you all provided um, us a great template and we were able to use that to, again, customize it to the language language and the specifics of our um, employees' personas. Um, and then being able to show that there was this continuum of not just training, but the self-assessment, so the empowerment that our employees felt. Um, and word got around, quite honestly. Um, you know, I had, um, you know, senior directors and folks um, pinging me and on our, our global Slack channel, which is what we created for, um, for the, the campaign of the program, saying this is a great program. Wow, I highly recommend that you take this. This is not your ordinary um, compliance or ergo course. This is good stuff. And so just that testimonial component really helped catala um, catapult it um, forward. It sounded like it just snowballed in such a positive way. Yes, yes. Awesome, thank you. Christy, you just come to us with um, a knowledge and experience, and, and we all want to know, as always, what's going on with Cal OSHA, right? So you, you kind of have an insight, but ultimately, you know, you have two people from your team that are going to be talking about the ergonomics of the Agile work environment. But even before we get to that session, you know, where, where do you find the, the struggle has been with creating a flexible work environment for such a diverse uh, work group, right? Because each one of your campuses in itself has its own culture and, and, that, and it's, that can be a challenge. So can you kind of expand on, you know, just creating that flexible work environment in multiple cultural uh, campuses or, or, or geographic locations? I, I can, um, you know, I, I do agree. We are, so we're 10 autonomous campuses. So not only are we multicultural and each location has their own um, style and culture, but they're autonomous. So, you know, if you we're more of a franchise model than a corporate model. So there's a, let me help you do it rather than this is how you shall do it sort of, um, initiative. Um, so that that's difficult in and of itself. But, um, you know, we kind of did the same thing that Martha did. We, you guys provided an incredible template. And uh, we put together a team from several of our campuses and several of our medical centers and uh, UCI's did. I was giggling when Martha said that because we do that with everything. Mm -hmm. um, so we UCI's did. And, you know, once you get the ergonomists it, involved in the development, there's buy-in, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, we rolled that out, um, and, and that went that went really, really well. We did that in record time. Um, the challenge that we're seeing is um, each campus had a different policy with respect to what are we going to provide our telecommuters or our employees while they're telecommuting, um, you know, and um, 
Some would let them come to a loading dock and pick up their chairs. Others wouldn't even let them have a, a docking station. So, you know, we had some employees in the in the in the beginning that were working off a laptop with no um, external input devices or a monitor or anything like that. So, um, it, it was really interesting. But we did bring stakeholders together for regular meetings. Um, they were monthly, um, sometimes a little more often, but there was a lot of idea sharing and. And so, you know, if someone came up with an idea that seemed to be successful, the others would kind of grab that concept, take it back to their campus and and implement it their way. So, um, you know, a lot just like we did uh, with everything related to this pandemic, we collaborated, collaborated, collaborated and just shared ideas. I think that it's awesome. And it sounds like it's really consistent between all three of you with your clients or with your organization. Um, D, you have the poll results. Do we want to um, pull those up and, and utilize that as a basis for, for the framework for our discussion? Wow, that's all over the board. <laughs> I was really, really kind of surprised by that, aren't you? Yeah. Christy, is yeah. that kind of representative of, of University of California? Not really, right? Because you're requiring people to go back to work. Um, you know, each again, each autonomous campus is doing it their way. So this is probably very representative <laughs> um, of what we look like at my level. Yeah. Sue, from your perspective, you know, you have multiple clients that, you know, are US based but are global as organizations. Is is that representative? You know, it's not surprising to me, uh, Bill, because there's so many different ways to address this. And I think every company that I work with is really evolving their strategy. Uh, and it, it tends to morph almost every day on what, you know, they're providing to their employees. I think, you know, generally overall providing training is the number one uh, thing that, that companies are doing is making sure that employees have the information that they need to set up their workstation at home uh, to the best possible uh, you know, ergonomic standards. Uh, they're also providing training on making sure that employees are getting up and moving during the day, uh, not just you know, sitting at their desk. And we are sitting longer working at home than we would in the office. You know, generally we get up, you know, walk over to talk to another colleague. We might, you know, use a restroom that's a little farther away than the one in our house. Uh, but at home, we tend to sit longer. We tend to be more focused and we're working longer hours. So that training becomes a really important piece of the puzzle in helping employees understand that, you know, they are in charge of their own health. But, we you know, did the same kind of goes back too. to... That kind of goes back to Christy's point too, though, right? That mm -hmm. you're going to have challenges as to if someone has a desk and chair at home or if they don't, uh, you know? So Christy, that, that in itself creates its own challenge with training people. It does. One of the things... Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Martha. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Me and my technical difficulties over here. Um, no worries. You know, that's what we... Um, we kind of did the same thing that Sue referenced is our training that we created was focused on behaviors. And, you know, we've never created anything like this. Talking about the couch as a workstation or the bed as a workstation, obviously we're not recommending that, but you know that's where people are landing is they're rolling over, grabbing their laptop, leaning against the headboard and logging in, or they're on the couch and they've probably got the TV on in the background or something, but they're on the couch, feet up on the coffee table. So a lot of our, um, our training was around, um, you know, where to work. And if you have no resources, you know, um, put some cookbooks down on your kitchen counter and, you know, bring your, uh, raise your monitor up and get a, get a keyboard, you know, talk to someone and get a keyboard or, um, you know, how to use your desk and, you know, and, and how to set up an office when your kids are home 
doing school from home too. I mean, my gosh, the challenges that people had, but <laughs> our training and our education and our really our focus of ergonomics was behavior-based. Um, like yeah. Sue said, get up and take the dog for a walk over lunch. Um, you know, make sure, set a timer, do something, go do something with your kids over lunch or during an afternoon break. Um, and it was less focused on equipment. Um, you know, I think in the traditional office, we say, oh, you know, your keyboard is too high. Let's get you a keyboard tray. And at home, we can't do that. So it really challenged our ergonomists too, to think a little bit differently. Martha, you were going to add to that. Yeah, I was just going to echo much of what um, Christy and Sue were saying, you know, the, the idea about flexible. So we talk about flexible work and, you know, whether that means you're in the office or at home. And also when you're right in either of those spaces, you know, the fact, the reality is that we want people to be able to work on a tablet because um, in, um, in, in the particular case of um, with EA, we had people who were working on a tablet. They had different um, needs. Some people had, you know, two different um, types of uh, docking stations and just many different um, uh, peripherals. And so to be able to say that you are not a robot, you know, sitting at your at a workstation for those eight plus hours a day is not realistic. And so how do you help people move to work at the dining table for a while, move to work on the couch for a while, move to sit outside and in, in their backyard and move in between of those, right? I think again, to, to Christy's point, when, when we EAified the product, there was, yes, the absolute, the training portion of it being the I'll call it the theory component of the basics, ergo basics. But then there was, again, that component of your movement in your life is essential. And I think that also was another reason that we had such great participation as well, too. I think that's amazing the way that you bring that up, because the other piece of it was, was making the training fit EA's culture. And, and I, I think, Sue and Christy, where you have clients, you know, Sue on your end or Christy, you have campuses, you can take pictures and screenshots of that. But when you have people working from home, you know, so they, they recognize the technology and the environment when they're working at home, you really don't have that. So Martha, when you started using anime and, and, and other like EA characters um, that employees recognize as EA characters, maybe that kind of brought a certain semblance of recognition when we couldn't, um, we couldn't pull up someone's office at home, <laughs> or as Chrissy said, they're working on the bed. So, you know, we're not yeah. going to have live video or pictures that way. So making it an EA program with, with other ways of, of having things that employees can recognize, like the anime and the characters, I, I thought that was pretty brilliant. Yes, and even some of the language that we used, you know, and I think that goes back again to as I'm looking at going forward and working and advising with other companies is really, it, it is so much of understanding of the organization's culture, right? And so, you know, even when you are um, a, a global organization, for me, what I see is you can have a global philosophy, but again, to really make it stick. And I think that Sue and, and Christy can, you know, um, um, agree on this too, is that while it's a global philosophy, those solutions need to be localized um, because it's that, that personal touch um, that, um, that you need to have um, in order for folks to truly yeah. adopt. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree. If we shift the gears a little bit, uh, one of the things that we heard over and over, and I just saw it in the poll of, you know, equipment or supplying equipment at home. One of the things that we continue to have questions on right from the beginning and even to now is, you know, what is that stipend? How much should we be giving our employees? What should the employees, you know, be given or, or money-wise, monetary-wise or equipment-wise? And Sue, you dealt with that quite a bit on the March end. Um, on a global aspect, can you kind of give us maybe your feedback as to what you saw was the consistent kit or the consistent spend for employees working from home? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've seen kind of the whole spectrum of not providing anything to providing everything. But generally, you know, when we talk about equipment for the home, you know, keyboards, mice, monitors are small enough items that if it's appropriate, 
you know, we're suggesting that our clients send their employees into the office to take those smaller items home. Uh, and, you know, just keeping a record of, you know, what has left the office. Uh, for larger items like chairs or desks, uh, you know, they, that gets a little more difficult because you want to make sure that if someone's coming into the office to get their chair, that they are, you know, capable of lifting this item in and out of their vehicle and into their home. Uh, you also have to consider, you know, where is that chair going and do you want that chair to come back to the office? You know, if there's small children or pets in the home or if there's a smoker in the home, do you really want that chair to come back into the office? Probably not. So, you know, you need to consider that when creating that um, policy. The other option is to provide a stipend. And I've seen everything from, you know, a monthly stipend up to, you know, say $1,000 in a one shot stipend. But again, you wanna be careful how that money is spent. Uh, one of the things that many of our clients are doing is requiring the employee to have an assessment so that they're, first of all, buying the right equipment and not just going and buying the $99 chair from the local uh, office supply store and taking the rest of the family out for a really nice steak dinner. So you wanna make sure that they know what the right options are and that they're picking suitable equipment. Uh, we've worked with a couple of clients and their facilities and procurement departments to set up the ability for employees to purchase items and we've limited the items that they can select. And through the assessment, they're provided with the right selection, but they can purchase through the company's procurement department at the company discount. So not only are they buying good quality items, but they're buying the right item that will suit them. You know, you don't want to sell a petite chair to someone who's six foot four. Uh, it also allows the company to track the spend. And that becomes important, you know, when you're looking at the overall big picture of corporate expense. We've done yeah, the same thing. thing. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you expand on that a bit from the UC side? Because I saw you and Martha nodding consistently with the training, with the doing an assessment or an evaluation before sending. Can you maybe expand on that from the UC side? Yeah, uh, you know, pre-COVID, we had that same concept. Um, um, you know, we will help subsidize the equipment, but we're going to ensure it's going to be the correct equipment. So we had what we called a matching funds program, and it's a um, deficit deferral program we started years ago. But um, what the way we do that is our we have this pot of money, and um, it's it's only to be used for injury prevention measures. So a lot of our ergonomics programs use that for a matching funds program. So um, let's just say Sue is new to a department um, at UCLA um, and she needs some ergonomic equipment. She needs to um, complete the online training and online risk assessment um, and to ensure she's getting, like she said, the proper equipment. And then it has to be Part of our approved catalog too. So as she said too, you can't just go to your, you know, office supply store around the corner or um, you're not picking on Costco, but you know, you can't go out to Costco and get your office chair. It has to be an approved chair by your ergonomics program in order to qualify for those matching funds. So obviously departments encourage their employees We'll, we'll get you the equipment you need, but you need to do this so that ergonomics pays for half of it. So that concept isn't new to the university and we carry that over to our telecommuters and our home workers um, at the university. So again, in order to qualify for any sort of uh, subsidized support or, or cost sharing, they had to take, they had to go through the Cardness program, they had to go through the um, training and the risk assessment and potentially meet like we are now on Zoom with um, an ergonomist, just to ensure that they have the right kinds of equipment. And then they need to ensure they have the right style or 
pre-approved equipment again so it's not something and that's something the university's done for years is we don't allow um just any equipment there's a lot of risk you know i we had a few incidents where a bookcase fell over and a chair broke you know and then you've got someone injured so um we've got a you know we're pretty firm on we have these furniture contracts in place for your health and safety and so you're going to use these furniture line. So um, we've done that to ensure that people um, do still have quality and appropriate equipment at home for their home offices. Thank you. Sounds like Martha does the same thing too. Yes. <laughs> all the nodding. Yes. We're yes. all doing this. Yep. I, I think for us, what was, you know, again, one of the really great aspects of with the with the training component was building in um, an acknowledgement. So, um, you know, we're talking about collaboration here, and this is absolutely something that, you know, as you said, Christy, just with your partners within, you know, within and without the organization, right? Collaborate, collaboration, collaboration, can't say it enough, right? Yeah. But being able to work with the, um, in this case, the workplaces team, the, the um, facility these folks to schedule so that employees um, could come to the campus um, safely and pick up their um, their equipment that they needed um, to work from home. If it wasn't, um, if that wasn't possible, workplaces um, scheduled with a local carrier. So we had a couple of campuses where it just wasn't possible for someone to get their car into where the, the campus is. And, yeah, and so, too. yeah, and so, um, but, you know, we organized the, all of that so that um, people could have those components, then go through the training with their with their products that they were familiar with. Um, and before they could do the assessment, they had to acknowledge that they had picked up this equipment so that they had the proper tools to begin with, the basics, if you will. Um, and then to be able to go through the training, or excuse me, the, the self-assessment, and then if needed, um, the virtual assessments. And similar to what Christy mentioned too, with the purchasing of products, I mean, I think that that um, acknowledgement component was huge in the cost containment for us because people picked up their chairs, their their monitors. I mean, and, and again, you can imagine the different types of teams had different types of equipment that were, you know, specialized for them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the corporate folks, you know, the basics um, as well, too, but being able to accommodate everyone from that perspective, so that when they did their assessments, they, um, the, the purchasing that was needed outside of what they already had was minimal. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of our campuses is um, in UCLA, and I, I do want to recognize and commend their ergonomics program for um, they're working with our furniture vendor. So they're taking it a step further. You know, we're talking about how we manage this crazy pandemic when everybody gets sent home, but now how are we managing it moving forward? You know, so we have select employees staying home on a full-time basis. We have some going back onto campus on a full-time basis. And then we've got a third group that's, you know, hybrid and going in for a couple of days and coming home. So how do you manage those? But they're working with our furniture vendor to create work at home packages. So it's a, a work yeah. surface and a chair for under a thousand dollars. So, yeah. um, you know, if we're looking at stipends and talking about stipends and that sort of thing, that's a really, that's a really key piece to that is work with your home vendor or your furniture vendor so that you're ensuring there's cost incentive um, for them to you know, purchase through there because it's their home. We can't force them to buy our, you know, our, our recommended furniture or our approved furniture, but we can't, we won't pay for it if they don't. So, you know, um, it's, uh, that's that's another key piece moving forward that UCLA is starting to do, and I I really commend them for that. I like what, I, I like what yeah. you're saying there. One of the one of the struggles that I still have, and and I think it goes back to Sue's statement, is you still need some sort of evaluation, right? Because you know we're a UK based organization, and John Abbott was talking about the idea that you know people have flats in London that are 400 square feet or 600 square feet. There might be you know, a couple of people living in that flat. So if you have two people working at two different companies and they each have a thousand dollar package, thousand pound in their case, you're, you're probably not gonna be able to fit both packages in. So you almost have to pick and choose at that point. And, and I guess what I'm getting at is 
you do need to evaluate, do they even have the space for what you want to send them, right? So is, it, is that giving them a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, autonomy or giving them a, a bit of voice too as to what you send them before you send it to them? Yeah, yeah. And you know, the other piece is the assembly of it. Um, you know, this is something I've telecommuted for, I worked from home for 10 years and had a high digestible table shipped to me. And suddenly I had this thing I had to put together. I had to go get a drill and do this. And, um, you know, I'm a pretty independent, um, you know, I, I'll get anything done, but I think about some of our employees who might be less resourceful mm -hmm. or have less resources, you know, not, not everybody's got um, drills and power screwdrivers and, you know, the wherewithal to be able to do that. So, you know, you've got to think about that too. You've got to include not just shipping costs, but assembly costs too. Yeah. And Sue brought up a really good point about um, just last week, it was my director, our executive director of EHS, who said, holy cow, I never realized how many different ways you could get hurt lifting an office chair <laughs> because he said, did you know everything moved? And I thought, how did you not know everything moved? <laughs> but literally like the, the cylinder started moving on them and then suddenly the armrests <laughs> are going different directions and the obviously the base is swiveling on him. But, um, you know, there's pinch points, there's um, ergonomic injuries, lifting it in and out of a car. There's all sorts of, you know, drop it on your toe sort of thing. So there, there's really a lot to consider here um, when, when you're talking about getting furniture from home. Yeah, and if, if I could add on to that, you know, assembly and installation are, you know, definitely things you need to think about. And, you know, when we're recommending an item, we, we do ask, you know, is there somebody in the home who can lift, you know, 50 pounds? Do you oh. have someone who can uh, assemble, but you know, if you've got somebody who says, "Oh yeah, I can put that chair together," uh, and they really can't, you know, what does that open you up for as far as liability? And if you're sending someone out to assemble or install something, you know, that's another liability. As soon as that person steps foot into the house, there's liability on both sides, not just for the person in the home. You know, if somebody doesn't do a good job. But there's yeah. also liability for the person coming into the home, you know, suppose there's an aggressive pet um, right. or, you know, something in the home, illegal substances or something that's clearly visible. Uh, so you need to be very careful on, you know, how you're shipping equipment to somebody's home. Yeah. You know, and conversely, if you, if, you know, you ask the employee to put it together, then there's the liability, you know, where's the liability there? As an employer, you've asked your employee to, to assemble this furniture. And then if they don't know how to do it and they do it incorrectly or, you know, sloppily, and then it falls and they're injured, then, you know, you're still liable for that too. You know, so it's, I guess we're saying that um, there's really no good answer to that. <laughs> I, I will say I, though, asked, yeah. I will say, I think that is one, and we touched on this a little earlier, is leveraging your vendors, right? So, yeah. um, because, yeah. you know, it, you're making sure at least the quality of the product, right? You're doing your, what you, um, within your span of control and for the safety and care of your employee, which is not, please don't, you know, we're not going to do the Costco piece, but, you know, what we did was we worked with our procurement piece. We worked with them, um, the Cardinus ergonomist team to help us come up with with that, um, Christy, as you were talking earlier about the, you know, the the basics package. And so we said, these are the things that you should have, whether you pick them up from the office or whether you need new ones, you know, right. and, um, and so that they were, um, you know, functional and and proper for uh, a home work environment and still provided that flexibility. But I do yeah. think that leveraging your vendors um, that you have and the existing master services agreements that you may have with them, which is what I um, what I made sure we did was, um, you know, because we had, we could also, again, you go back to that cost containment piece, um, you know, that you're able to leverage those vendors and the pricing that you have with them and knowing that the product itself is going to be something that's quality. Martha, um, I, quick question came to mind when you were talking about that. I'm just curious, what products did you like identify as your threshold? 
um, for working yeah. from home. So docking station, external device, you know, because everybody's on a laptop. So docking station, external monitor, external input devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, so it was okay. two, it was two monitors, the keyboard, the mouse, um, the, two monitors. Um, the docking station. Yes. Because most of the work that, uh, and see, that's an EA kind of a thing, right? So that's, that's understanding that aspect of it. But yeah. Um, and then um, and cameras because um, the culture is to be on Zoom, um, and so wanting to make sure that people had an external camera as well, mm -hmm. and their chair. Yeah, we're looking at that now, Bill. As folks are going back to campus, um, we're looking at our hybrid. You know, I talked about the hundred percent campus, hundred percent home, and then the hybrid. And the hybrid model kind of looks like. Bill's going to go in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to go in Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. And we're going to have a shared workstation. Um, and so, you know, in the, well, previously, that was because we all had to be physically distanced. Now we don't. But now we're talking about reducing our real estate footprint because people are working from home. So we don't need the same size real estate footprint we had in the past. So um, yeah. the, the, uh, um, but going back, we're talking about these shared workstations. What um, what's the threshold of equipment that we need to provide at these workstations? So, um, you know, I don't think they spoke yet, Bill or D. But um, two of the ergonomists from the university are going to talk about what are those requirements and what are the requirements of the workstation and yeah. what are we including in that. So that's another thing coming up. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that because I, I think that's something that we all are trying to figure out as well, right? And, you know, at one point in time, we were talking about MSD claims or issues um, with putting equipment together. And I, I was trying to stop because I felt like that was a nice segue to one of the questions that we were having. But you kept going on equipment and it is such an important thing with the employees at home and now going back into the office with shared workspace. So, you know, I certainly didn't want to slow you down there, but we did have a question in regards to just metrics. Um, Sue, Christy, Martha, did you have uh, any data to show that there's a reduction in MSD claim uh, or, or you know, just injuries in general um, by putting out programs like this? Or were there other metrics maybe that you did track, uh, Sue, for your clients um, through this time that it may not, you may not have had enough time to look at the loss runs of MSD on the health insurance or comp side, but you know, were there metrics that kind of proved out the success of the program other than a feel good, right? Because ultimately we want return on investment. Yeah, Bill, I think it's very interesting to note that we have not seen an uptick of MSD claims uh, through the pandemic. And th I think there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, MSDs take months, sometimes years to manifest. Uh, secondly, people were so, uh, distracted when they first went home to work, trying to get set up, trying to figure out what to do with the kids who were doing online learning. You know, maybe your partner is also working at home and trying to figure out the logistics. Uh, so they were thinking about other things first. Uh, now that we've been home for, you know, 15, 16 months, I think, you know, people are a little reluctant to report discomfort because they want to stay working at home. And so they don't want to open that door to conversation. But I think overall, um, you know, implementing ergonomics uh, programs for those who are working at home and who may continue to work at home or in a hybrid model yeah. uh, has provided a feel good that, you know, we care about you. It, it's helped with uh, employee engagement, employee retention, and it has definitely reduced absenteeism. Oh, that's interesting. Christy, on your end from UC, were there metrics that you tracked or saw that brought value to some sort of ROI or, or proof, proof in the pudding? Yeah, we, you know, just looking at our claim information, um, there's a, uh, I think I, I responded in the chat to Sean that we were, you know, we've got 18 locations going on. So, you know, everybody's a little different, but we're either flat or see a decrease. And, and I agree with all the, the um, points that Sue raised. You know, um, I think too, 
people saw working from home as such a benefit that they didn't want to file anything because they didn't want to be sent back, um, you know, and, and I think now too, and, and it's a legitimate point, um, you know, if, if you're working from home and you've got a claim because of your workstation and we've done everything we can, we might just need to send you back to your office um, where, you know, whatever that change is, is clearly not a driver for your um for your injury or your discomfort. So, um, yeah. but so far we've been pretty lucky. I do think the landscape's gonna change a little bit moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna see, you know, an uptick in these claims um, in the next couple of years for several reasons. One, the perception is changing, the culture is gonna change, but also as Sue mentioned, you know, sometimes it takes a while for these to manifest. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. like a slip and fall and you, you know, you've got immediate, discomfort or symptoms, you know, these take a while. And, um, and I think too, um, Sue raised another good point is, you know, there was a lot of distractions going on. <laughs> I, for one day, I don't, my kids aren't at home, but I didn't know what to do work. And, you know, it wasn't a big change for me, but I was still distracted because everybody else was at home. So, um, but moving forward, we're going to start to really hunker down on our workload again and, and really focus on normal operations and business as usual. And so I think work will become more intense, more stressful, and, and perhaps longer in duration as we start to resume normal operations from home. So I think behaviors are going to change a little bit. So I think it's really critical at this point uh, to remind everyone that they need to continue these behaviors at home to um, continue to take these breaks and stretch and move yeah. around and not sit in the same position all day. Yep. Mm -hmm. Martha, from yeah. your perspective, metrics. Yeah, um, so definitely there was the, the cost containment that we had out of this just with the, the um, front load of having the equipment um, um, from the office being brought out to people's homes, that was huge. Um, definitely the ergo assessments themselves. I mean, that was, again, some of the great testimonials and feedback that folks gave us was that uh, the ergonomist just helped them do minor tweaks and wow, game changer for them. And the reminders from the, um, from, and this is from the Cardinus Ergo team, but you know, huge kudos to Holly and that team because um, so much of what they shared was about the behavior changes um, and having people recognize it just that's the getting up, the sitting, the standing. I mean, we also built that into the, into the training itself. And so there was the reinforcement from um, mm. the ergonomist of what was tr in the training program, which again, you know, we all know we, as lifelong learners, we need to continuously hear things, you know, over and over uh, to reinforce yeah. these. So that was huge. Um, and, you know, just going to the, to the whole hybrid workforce, one of the things that we, that we did with Cardness, um, which I, working with you all again, would absolutely do was those different personas, because we were able to be um, forward thinking in that now if people are working from the office, they can still use the same Cardness program. Now they're just going to have a different profile. So they would have their home office profile and then they're in the office profile. So whatever those hoteling situations or setups might be for them, they'll be able to use the tool and have a new, um, a new profile that can help them um, work through it and, and, and get them to the, um, to the place that they need to be for their proper setup. I appreciate that. Yeah. And one last point about behaviors, you know, I, I think it's so true. I think that, you know, while things are so, you know, we're opening up, people are getting back to what yeah. you know, the new normal or 2.0 of all of this. And, and I think just that reinforcement of those behaviors of what people have learned along the way, while work may get more intense or, you know, depending on the kind of work that people do is to continue with those behaviors of getting up, of stretching, of socializing, of connecting with other people, and whether that is in the office or on Zoom, either way. No, I, I completely agree. And I, this discussion, I think, could last another hour. <laughs> but I, I apologize. We, we absolutely have to wrap up so we can start another session on this. So Sue, Martha, Christy, thank you for taking time out of your day to, to share your wealth of knowledge. And I just want to thank everyone um, that that sat in, that participated in, and listened in. And if you need more information, you know, please feel free to reach out to any of us. And ultimately, 
this has been recorded, so it will be shared, but it almost sounds like we need to do uh, this panel version two in about a month and, and share more information. Thank, thank you everyone again. Really, really appreciate your time.